Test one. Test one. One, one, two, one, two. Testing one, two, one, two. Test, test one, test one, two. Is it out? I guess it's good. Okay. Test one, 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 two, one, one, two. It is our joy to welcome all of you to worship this morning. It's such a joy to see each of you, and we hope that you'll uh, sign the Red Ritual Friendship Pad this morning so we'll be aware of your presence with us. Today we continue our discipleship emphasis, and we remind you that next week is our Dedication Sunday, so we ask all of you to bring your 2020 time and talent forms as well as your financial giving cards with you to worship. And we will dedicate our commitments to the Lord next week during our worship time together. Our Calvary at the Table program continues on Wednesday evenings with a meal served at 5, followed by programming for all ages at 6. And this Wednesday, our adult program will welcome the Reverend Jeff Carter. Jeff is our Moravian chaplain with the Forsyth Jail and Prison Ministry. And we support Jeff annually through our benevolent giving. So we hope that you'll be here to hear all about ministry opportunities that we might be engaged in. Calvary will also participate in a provincial day of service next Saturday at Laurel Ridge as we work together on Oaks 4, a cabin in the summer camp that was adopted a few years ago by our men's fellowship. And the group will arrive around 9 a.m. and they'll be heading home by mid-afternoon. So we hope that you'll join them. I'd now like to call on Spencer Bullins, Chair of our Board of Trustees, for an announcement about our organ renovation. Spencer? Thank you, Lane. Uh, good morning. So I want to talk about the organ. Uh, there's an insert in the bulletin that Lane prepared. That's uh, interesting reading. It's got dates and technical information about the organ. And um, take this home. Keep it. Keep it somewhere where you can pull it out from time to time and and reread it. Um, when I'm when I'm in this sanctuary, I look around. I can't help but think how fortunate 
we are to have this incredibly beautiful sanctuary as our, our church home. Um, you know, the windows, if you have young children or if you have grandchildren, bring them in here when it's quiet and walk around and show them the windows and tell them the stories that are depicted about Christ on, on these beautiful windows. And part of what has made this such a wonderful worship environment is our, our organ. Um, I can remember back when uh, my dad, George's sister, Mary Catherine Walker, was the organist. I think that was, um, I think that was during Doug, Doug Kimmel's time. And I, I think about folks that I can remember, um, Dr. Boringer, Roger Daggy, um, Mary Beard, and Ramona, and uh, Mary Lou. These, these uh, are all special musicians who have, have uh, been able to make this wonderful instrument sing. When I was a little tiny guy with my aunt up here playing, I thought that all the music came out of the pipes in the front, what we call the facade pipes. Um, I didn't know then that there are over 2,000 more pipes behind there that all together make this thing uh, so beautiful. So it's been an integral part of our worship experience since uh, 1926. So the sanctuary and the organ, the organ, organ was dedicated uh, with the new sanctuary on Easter Sunday, 1926. So if I, if I did my math right this morning, that's 93 years. 93 years of, of generations of children growing up in this church and, and I know a lot of us sort of uh, forget and take it for granted, but I don't want you to do that, just like these beautiful windows. I don't ever want you to take it for granted. So it's our privilege and our responsibility now that it's needing such repair to, to have it renovated, which has been going on, uh, as you know, for the last uh, four months or so. Uh, we made a contract with Tom Lutak, who is an or organ builder, and it's a $140,000 contract. He is, uh, uh, of course, most of the work he's doing is at his, his facility, so we don't see that going on here yet, but uh, if you have been thinking about donating, uh, we've raised about a little over 120,000 of the 140 that we need. Now's a good time. Uh, he should be wrapping up in the next, uh, I'm guessing, 30 to 45 days, and um, that's when we're going to need this money. So, um, also. Mark your calendars that uh, Mary Lou is going to do a uh, rededication recital on November 16th. That's a Friday night at, or Friday afternoon at 4 p.m. And hey, um, come to that and bring a friend. Bring someone perhaps who has never been in this sanctuary. Um, bring them and let them experience uh, the beauty that, that we get to see every every Sunday and pretty soon we'll be hearing again from our organ. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Lane. Thank you.
Praise my soul, the King of heaven, hymn 529. Shall we stand as we sing together? I invite you to remain standing as we pray together our liturgy this morning, which can be found as an insert in your bulletin. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For He is our God. We are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. seated. Let us pray for trust in God, that in all the situations of life we may not be troubled by needless anxiety or doubt, but may come to him as our loving Heavenly Father, hallowing God's name in everything that reveals God, both in the natural world and in the Holy Scriptures, given for the guidance and salvation of all. Let us pray for divine guidance, that God's will may be known and done among the nations, so that we and the whole world may come to a fuller knowledge of God's truth and love, as the gospel of Jesus Christ spreads throughout the whole world until all people come to know him as Savior and Lord. Let us pray for faithfulness, not only in great matters, but also in the smallest things. That we, may, that we may pattern our lives after Christ's example and be his holy people to our life's end. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Let us pray for earthly necessities, not only for ourselves, but that all God's children may be clothed and sheltered and fed. Let us pray for forgiveness, that our merciful Father may renew his image in us, so that we and all people may be freed from bitterness and malice, forgiving one another as he in Christ has forgiven us. Let us pray for strength from above, that God may grant us his power and protection to support us in all the dangers and temptations of life. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let us pray for the constant awareness of God's presence within each of us and within God's whole church, that we may be comforted by his love and strengthened for witness and service to all of creation in the name of Christ. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. continue our worship this morning, I invite our ushers to come forward to receive this morning's offering.
gracious God, source of our daily bread, you feed us with your love. Equip us to share in your purpose. Lord, receive these offerings that we bring to you as your disciples. Continue to expand our hearts until we live with the boldness of your grace. We pray all of these things in the name of Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament lesson for today is Psalm 113. Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God? Who dwelleth on high? Who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth? He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifted the needy out of the ash heap that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. He grants the barren woman a home, like a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. Please stand for the reading of our gospel. The Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, according to Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. He also said to his disciples, There was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and he said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my master has taken the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I am ashamed to beg. I have resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him, and he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? So he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. I'd like to invite the children to come forward for a few moments. How is everybody? We've got a few more coming. What have I got here this morning? Coins. What kind of coins? Pennies. You want one? Let's, I'm going to give you each one. How about that? There you go, Sarah. Well, I'm going to give you another one. How about that? There's your one. You'll, let's give Pastor Chaz one too. I was hoping. <laughs> now, these pennies are very special to me. 
You see, I have them in a plastic bag. And it was really hard for me this morning to give you one of my pennies because I really like them a whole lot. And there's one penny that I really, really like. <clears throat> and I keep this penny in a special box. And usually I keep a piece of cotton down in here and I put the penny on top of it because I don't want the penny to be hurt. And I keep this little box on my table by my bed. And every night before I go to bed, I make sure that that penny is still in here and that nobody has taken my penny because I really love this penny a whole lot. Okay, you get the picture? Do you think I'm a little crazy? <laughs> Matt says he thinks. Well, Jesus tells us this morning that we're not supposed to be greedy. What does greedy mean? Do you think I was being greedy about this, Addison? Kinda. What does greedy mean? <coughs> worship the things that you have instead of worshiping God do you think maybe that I was a little bit strange about this penny almost like I was worshiping this penny and sometimes we do that with our money we do that with our possessions we may do that with our toys with something that we own or have we may think that it's so special that we're not going to share it with anybody else and Jesus tells us that we can't be like that how would Jesus want us to be He'd want us to be nice. He'd want us to share what we have with other people. So if I was going to be like Jesus, I would have said this morning, you can have all of these pennies. But what did I say? I said they were really special to me, and I almost sort of didn't want to give you one, did I? So remember that in your life, that the best thing to do is to live with open hands and to be willing to give to other people. And guess what? You can keep your penny. <laughs> Let's have a prayer together. Dear God, thank you for everything that you have given to us because we know that what we have is a gift from you and help us to share what we have with others and to not be greedy and want only things for ourselves but to also be willing to help others and to give to them. Bless us and help us to be examples of your love every day. Amen. 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 <laughs>
and every bruised heart, every calloused hand, every faded dream. So God, move among us now. Receive our spirits as the offerings that we bring to you this morning. Merciful God, may we breathe deeply in this room this morning your reconciling love, your holy expectation for each of us. Allow us not to see Allow us to see the faces of those we've harmed, of those we've kept at a distance. Work in each of us, God, until our hearts are softened and we dare to seek our neighbor's good. Teach us to pray with our hands and our feet and our voices. Hear our prayers this morning. We lift, up to, we lift up to you now all that seems unreconcilable in our families, in our schools, and in our workplaces. Lord, we lift up all that seems irreconcilable in our nation. In your church and in your world. Lord, we pray for all of those who we identify as leaders in every sphere of our life. Lord, we pray for our president and all of those whose decisions weigh heavily on others. Lord, give us the courage to name ourselves as those who have great responsibility. Teach us to tend to the world you love, to sow more than we reap, to heal more than we wound, to make room for others as you made room for us. Gracious Savior, we pray for all of those who are beset by illness or grief, our friends and loved ones whose hearts and bodies are sick. May we go to those whose joy is gone and be your light and your love. So Lord, we pray with hearts both eager and reluctant, trusting that you will meet us and call to us just as we are. In the name of Christ our Savior we pray, amen.
Let us pray together. O oh God, in these moments we share together, we pray that you will help us to listen for your voice speaking to each one of us. And may we live our lives in such a way that they will be lived with open hands. Amen. There is a character in Tolkien's book, Lord of the Rings, Schmeagol. Schmeagol is a hobbit. He's a member of a small, friendly, insular species of human-like creatures. And one day, he discovers a ring. When the wearer slips it on, it makes him invisible and grants him long life. But the ring possesses this insidious power because the hobbit finds himself developing this obsession with the ring. A terrible fear that he might lose it or that somebody might take it from him. Over time, he becomes so obsessed with the ring that he withdraws from the community to live below the ground, cradling my preciousness, he calls it. His greed for the ring changes the shape of his body and his spirit. And he becomes mean-spirited, vindictive, jealous. He grows slimy and thin, and the ring he so clings to becomes his undoing. That longing for more, more money, more goods, more possessions is the subject of a parable Jesus tells about a dishonest manager on a rich man's estate. Charges, it seems, were brought against the manager that by not managing the estate well, he was wasting his master's goods. And so angry at learning this, the master basically fires the manager and asks him to give an account of his management. And as you can imagine, the manager is afraid of what's going to happen to him after he loses his job because he says to himself, I'm not strong enough to dig ditches and I'm too ashamed to beg. So with that in mind, the manager comes up with a scheme that will help him, he hopes, to keep his job. And after talking to all those who owed his master's money, the manager falsifies the amount of each one's debt in his master's account book. Wisely, the manager knows this will have two results. First of all, the master's debtors will be grateful to him. And second, if he involves all of them in falsifying the records, he'll be in a strong position to exercise a little judicious blackmail. Now the parable ends in a sort of strange way. When his master discovers his manager's dishonest dealings, instead of becoming more angry, he praises him for his shrewdness. Hmm. Jesus, using a dishonest manager's shrewd dealing as the object of a parable. What's Jesus trying to teach us? I don't think that Jesus is condoning dishonesty. Rather, he's praising the manager's shrewdness as if to say, if only those who follow God would be that shrewd in managing the resources that have been given to them. Jesus seems to be saying that part of the wise management of our resources is the realization that what we possess or what we gain for ourselves is never going to make us happy. Our wealth, our possessions, those things that we so tightly cling to in the hope of security and happiness can become gods to us if we aren't careful. And like the character in The Lord of the Rings, we'll find ourselves drowning, trying to hold on to what we thought all along would make us happy. Now, unfortunately, you and I live in a consumer culture. 
and we are bombarded by advertising online, on television, on the billboards as we drive by, and they would lead us to believe that happiness is only as far away as our next purchase. Whether it's a new car, or a new pair of shoes, or a larger diamond, or a particular good. And there's probably not one of us in this room this morning that can't confess to exercising a little retail therapy. <laughs> Shopping in person or online in the hope that our mood or our disposition might be improved. Yet what we often find in the newness of what we accumulate is the exact opposite effect. It's ironic, isn't it? That what we think is going to make us happy really doesn't. In fact, it can sometimes make us more unhappy. Joshua Becker, who advocates a sort of min, min, I can't say this word, minimalist approach to life, writes these interesting observations about our quest for more. He says, all of the things we obtain begin to fade because they are temporary by nature. They look so shiny, they look so new in the store, but immediately as soon as the package is open, they begin to perish or spoil or fade. And there's always going to be something new around the corner, new models, new styles, new improvements, new features, from clothes to cars to kitchen gadgets to technology. Our world is constantly moving forward and changing. And each purchase seems to add some extra worry to our lives. Every physical item that we bring into our lives represents one more thing that can be broken or scratched or stolen. Then he says this, possessions require maintenance. The things we own require time and energy and focus because they need to be cleaned, organized, managed, and maintained. And then as a result, they distract us from the things that really will bring us happiness. Henry David Thoreau once said, the price of anything is the amount of life that you have to exchange for it. I want to share with you this morning an old Indian parable about a guru who had a star disciple. And he was so pleased with the man's spiritual progress that he left him on his own. The disciple lived in a small mud hut and his only clothing was his loincloth. He lived simply and he begged for his food. Each week the disciple washed his loincloth and he would hang it out to dry. And one day he came back to the village to discover that his loincloth was torn and eaten by rats and so he begged his fellow villagers for another loincloth, and they gave it to him. But the rats ate that one. So he decided he would get himself a cat. That took care of the rats. But now when he begged for his food, he had to beg for milk too. So he got a cow to feed his cat. But now he had to beg for hay to feed his cow. So in order to feed his cow, he decided to till and plant the ground around his hut. But soon he found no time for contemplation, so he hired workers to tend his farm. And overseeing the laborers became a chore too, so he got married to have a wife who would help him on the farm. His wife didn't like the mud hut that they lived in, and she demanded a real house. So the man had to grow even more crops and hire more servants to keep his wife happy. And in time, the disciple became the wealthiest man in the village. Years later, this man's guru was traveling nearby, so he stopped in to see his old student. And he was shocked, shocked at what he saw. Where once stood this simple mud hut, there now loomed this great palace surrounded by a vast estate with many servants. What's the meaning of all this, he asked his disciple. You wouldn't believe this, sir, the disciple replied. 
But there was no other way that I could keep my loincloth. <laughs> That's exactly why Jesus ends the parable of the dishonest steward with these challenging words. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now Jesus isn't saying that having money or having possessions is a bad thing. He's just telling us to hold on to them lightly. Because ultimately they will not bring us meaning. They will not bring us purpose. If we hold on to our things, our possession, our money so tightly with greedy hearts, both of these things become like gods to us. They are idols we worship instead of the living God. Mark Thielen writes these words, When money is given first place in our lives, we are guilty of practicing idolatry, placing things above God. When we prioritize material possessions, we also do great damage to God's creation. And when we love money more than God, ultimately we waste our lives in a worthless pursuit to accumulate more and more stuff. Stuff we think that will ultimately make us happy, but it becomes a burden and it's eventually thrown away. So when we look at today's passage and the whole of Jesus' teaching about money and possessions, it's very clear. Disciples, those who want to follow Jesus Christ, avoid greed. They keep the things of this world in their proper perspective. They hold them lightly, knowing that they're not ultimately the things that will bring life meaning. In fact, Jesus teaches us, doesn't he, that the antithesis of greed is sharing. Because a disciple's life has to be characterized by life not lived with the tight fist of hoarding, but with the open hand of sharing. It's living with the attitude, what can I give instead of what can I gain? Have you ever noticed that the people who seem to be happier in life are people who give, people who don't hold on so tightly to what they have. Before our discipleship dedication Sunday next week, I, I hope we'll all ask God to help us live with open hands and to think about how we can give to God instead of what we can receive from Him. What can I give of myself, of my time, of my abilities, of my financial resources to partner with God and my fellow Christians to help our church share love in this community? What gift or gifts can I give that would convey my gratitude for all I've been given. I think we'll find that what Jesus said was indeed true. The more we live our lives with a giving attitude, the richer we'll really feel. I was thinking the other day about the giving model that Jesus provides for us in the example of his own life. Never once in the Gospels, do you hear Jesus asking for something for himself? It seems he's always about a life of giving to God by giving to others. With an open hand, he takes the hand of a little girl with a fever and he cures her. With an open hand, he heals the sick who come to him, the blind and the lame, with an open hand, he receives those others will not receive. And then with two open hands, he receives the painful blows of crucifixion. He gives, he gives, he gives, over and over again for you and for me. So the question before us is what will we give to Him? 
How are we going to emulate His life by not living with tight fists, but with open hands? The truth is, fellow disciples, God needs you. And His body of His church needs you. And it's really not about warm bodies. It's not about budgets. It's about living the kind of life Christ calls us to. And that when we do that sincerely, and when we do that together, when we all give, when we all participate, when we all seek to live with open hands, something mysterious happens. We suddenly have more than enough to do anything that God is calling us to do. So between now and next week, I want to challenge all of us to really think about, to really pray about and decide as individuals and as families what gifts in our lives will best honor the Christ who has given His all for every one of us. John Wesley, the great founder of Methodism who was greatly influenced in his early life by Moravians in England, wrote this in a sermon he once preached on the Christian's use of money. I think Wesley had it pretty right. Earn all you can, he said. Save all you can. Give all you can. For as Jesus reminds us, disciples cannot serve both God and money. Let us pray. O God, by your Holy Spirit moving and acting in all of our hearts, help us to understand once again that the greatest happiness we can ever have in this life before we come to you is in giving to others. Remind us of how you have given so much for us and may we respond to your great gift of love by loving you with our whole selves that we may truly be your disciples. Amen.
as you go forth to give. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord lift the light of His countenance upon you and give you peace.